Hello ladies, I'm Mrs. Sherman and I have a blog for which I will leave the link in the description box. I don't have comments here on the video channel. Please go to my blog and leave a comment and join in with everyone else and look at what else is going on on that blog. Go and visit my friends on my blog roll and see what this is all about. This is a homemaking support video that I have been doing. It began when my old computer from the olden days came uh, became dysfunctional with the keyboard and if you think that the E is the most used letter of the English alphabet and the English language try doing without an N. You have to get real creative with for instance I will tell you to leave a remark because comment has an N in it. You know you can't even describe a, a feeling like agony because it's got an N in it. So then I decided, well, I'll just get on here and talk. And while I talk, the purpose is you can take your device around and listen to something while you do your laundry, while you sort a bookshelf, while you clean a drawer, while you do your dishes, just basically your basic uh, housekeeping. I know sometimes I like to listen to something, and I'll put something on my little phone and put it in my apron pocket and take it around while I sweep or something that I'm doing that that uh, doesn't have much noise. I don't uh, vacuum anymore because uh, my, my carpets are gone and I have floor instead which is really nice. I like it so much better. And so if you will please go to my blog and leave a comment. There you will also find my PayPal on the left and many other articles that you might like to go see. So today I would like to first address a couple of emails that I got. My email is over there too if you'd like to email me. That would be great. Uh, and one of my emails uh, is complaining about the uh, way my face is washed out and the video doesn't work very well. And uh, But if you can hear me, that's the point. I really don't want you to sit here and watch me because I uh, this is a homemaking support video so you can go around and do some work and listen to something. I always like to listen to something and I have my favorite videos that I put in but then you have to go and um, check the next chapter if it doesn't play all or you have to go and take it out and insert a new disc so I thought it might be nice to listen to something that you don't have to check all the time and it has uh, only the things that you're interested in so one of the things that uh, we talked about last time was the use of vinegar in your home you know you could also use it I put it in a spray bottle. I don't mix it with water or anything else, but I put it in a spray bottle and I use it to freshen the air in the house and I'll open the door and I spray it all around because if you get somebody in the house maybe that has been a smoker or who, we're out in the country, and you get someone who has a wood fire and they'll come in smelling <laughs> like ashes and so uh, you, can re you can refresh your home if you've had any kind of uh, problem in your kitchen and maybe you've uh, burned something you can spray the vinegar around and then you don't have a toxic chemical around and uh, it makes everything smell natural and fresh and the smell of the vinegar goes away well today I'm wearing my uh, pink dress and I should probably get a photo of it for my blog that shows the close-up print but what it is is it's a, a tone on tone which I just love I know a lot of the Hawaiian quilts are a solid background or a white background with one color on it and this is the way this is and there were several choices of this this comes in yellow this comes in aqua blue it comes in other colors and what it is is looks like hummingbirds and feathers on it and I really like it and today I also am using a teacup to go with one of you uh, very quiet people sent me a set of six of these in different colors and this pink one just goes perfectly with this dress and I just love it I'm usually reluctant to buy something online because you can't feel it and can't tell if it's rough but this is a nice shiny smooth teacup this is my favorite shape this bowl shape I like it the best I think the tea tastes better in it so I want you to have another look at this thank you for whoever sent it to me there were six of them all each in a different color so now I can wear six different outfits and have a teacup to go with. And so, um, whoever you were, you were quite sneaky and you're not telling me who you are. Or maybe 
it got sent to the wrong address. I don't care. It's mine now. I'm keeping it. <laughs> Finders keepers. And so today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, clothing a little bit. I know this doesn't have anything to, ha to do with housekeeping, but look, if you'll dress up in something, now my, my clothes, I'll even use uh, a formal dress pattern to make a cotton dress if I like the shape of it better and if it looks nicer. So you can, you don't have to, now people were telling me about the house dresses of the 1950s. They really weren't very nice. They were the ugliest things. They often had snap buttons down the front. They were too short. Uh, they were basically the 1950s versions of jeans and t-shirts. They just weren't very nice and I never liked them. And I lived in the 1950s. You know the clothes really didn't fit that well. They weren't, they were, uh, they had these waistlines that were so tiny that no matter what size you, you ordered, if you sat down the waistline would kind of creep up. And so I'm not really that crazy about the 1950s styles. I know there are some people that just love them, and if you can wear them, fine. But I lived in the 1950s, and they weren't, uh, they weren't, they didn't fit very well, and uh, they also had the kind of strange, edgy um, patterns. Some of them were pretty, and they were hard to find. But I'm not that fond of them. I really was uh, delighted with some of the 1960s and 1970s patterns that came out. They were quite cute. And uh, not everything in the 1960s was bad. I was a teenager in the 1960s, and the patterns were quite nice. And the uh, clothing that you're choosing from the stores, and I know that not all of you sew. Um, I'm rather fond of the Laura Ashley patterns, and the Laura Ashley company is now producing more patterns for the McCall's, which are quite nice. And I noticed that uh, Kate of England... Uh, was wearing some of them, and I saw them when there was a sale for $1.99 on McCall's patterns at Hobby Lobby. I noticed uh, some of these uh, Laura Ashley patterns coming on. They, not all of them had were modest, but you can raise a neckline, and you can sew up a side, you can lengthen it, you can do different things with it. But that, those were my favorite patterns. They were like a shirt and a skirt sewn together, and they had the charm of the beautiful cotton prints that were so nice. I want to talk more about why uh, the clothing, when you go to look for something for your little girl or for yourself, is so difficult to find something that has good coverage and still is modest because you can find something that has really good coverage You say, oh, it has a sleeve on it. Oh, it, it will cover, you know, this little <laughs> flappy part of my arm. Oh, uh, it, it goes, you know, it has a higher neckline, so when you lean over, you know, it doesn't gape. Um, oh, it has a nice length, and it's not too tight. But then you start to notice that the designer has created it so that the areas that are rubbed out, let's say there's a little round rubbed out here, particularly in the denim clothing, they'll rub out certain areas uh, to make them stand out. And uh, to me, it makes you just look fatter and they'll rub out areas on the chest and they'll rub out areas on the back and on the legs and so you'll think this is a nice garment and start looking at it more carefully you see all these rubbed out areas well um, so uh, I want to go back to the picture and how it's not coming up very well for some of you and it's too uh, washed out too bright too dark you know my hair uh, doesn't show up because the background is too dark and that sort of thing. I am changing over to another computer, but I have to get my eight-year-old grandson to come and do it for me. If you want anything uh, of technology done, get the youngest one in your family. They know how to do it quite quickly. It's quite tedious for me. But if it comes to that and it's too difficult for you, I will turn the camera to the other side and you can look at my view out my window or a teapot while I'm talking. You're not really supposed to be watching me anyway, you're supposed to be listening. So I hope that you can hear me. I'm sitting back a little bit further and uh, so I'm not sure about the volume, but I want to uh, talk to you about several different things this morning and uh, a lot of it is a result of emails that I have got, so it's giving me some new ideas. So. Uh, I wanted to go to this little subject here, and that is that things have changed here. 
things have changed in the U.S. There's a dif there's a difference. There's an atmosphere of, I guess you know. I was talking yesterday about uh, these bad attitude people that come into your life and everything is down and everything is the opposite of what you say. You can't get a conversation going with them because they'll run you down, and they want you to fail or they they just have this failure. They get their they get their pumped up enthusiasm out of making everybody <laughs> miserable. And if you give them a good answer or a good solution, they pout because they don't want to know the bright side of things. They don't want to know how the solution of anything. And you, as a homemaker, you're probably a homemaker because you just want to get some things done. You really don't want to stew about the philosophy behind it or whether or not uh, you should um, you should uh, argue the cause, you know, and uh, that's one thing I've noticed about the naysayers and the gloom and doomers. They want to argue about something that cannot be changed. Years ago, there was a movie based on a book, uh, the old, an old book. Oh my goodness, I can't even think of who the author was. It was a southern writer, a southern gentleman that wrote in the 1800s after the Civil War, when the war, uh, the South was so uh, defeated and poor, and this man, the Southern gentleman, came up to visit a cousin in the North, uh, hoping for some, uh, looking for some, um, some way to finance his his business. I'm not quite sure, but it, I believe it was called the Bostonians. Okay, I'm not going to recommend the movie. It was changed into a movie. I'm not going to recommend the movie uh, because I'm not sure what's all in it. But what the story was was about his cousin, Olive, who had become a feminist in the 1800s, and she held meetings where she argued about things that you just wouldn't believe. She was the type of person that would argue that uh, the night should be the day. Why should we accept that? Why should we accept that the moon comes out at night? Why not the sun? Well, she'd argue in a circle about things like that and uh, never get anywhere, but that was how... I told you, it's like these people have... Uh, they're they're like a hamster in a cage with that little wheel and they just go round and round and round with these stupid arguments and they never get anything done. I do better if I'm with people who like to solve things, who like to do things better, who like to um, show me, share with me something that will make my life happier. So even God had to straighten out some bad attitudes. If you'll notice in the Old Testament he had to chastise Moses and Elijah and people that were uh, feeling sorry for themselves and saying that something couldn't be done or that they were the only ones doing it. And he would tell them to get up and go do this or get up and go do that. And that is the solution, I think, to this uh, to lower spirits is to get up and do something. However, uh, that's what friends are for and that's what your mother is for and your daughter is for and your and uh, the people around you that can help you when we're not all down at the same time. And But I was going to tell you that things have changed here in America, and uh, particularly uh, in Oregon where I live, um, because there is an optimism, and uh, people are happier, and I think uh, there was a scripture about that, that when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. And so there's an attitude of optimism and people are uh, exercising more of their creativity and uh, creating businesses and uh, also we're seeing more things made in USA and particularly the cottons which I love on the end of the bolt it's so nice to read you know made in USA so I know some of our cotton is being produced here and I know our factories are in some of the uh, eastern and southern places and anyway things have changed also as far as this welfare mentality the welfare mentality sent generations of people into this attitude that someone else was going to do something for you so uh, now you can't uh, there was a you can't get welfare here unless it's been particularly in this state unless you um, are going through a very rough time and you're between jobs or uh, and it's only temporary. You can only get it temporary. You can't get on it for a lifetime. And uh, one of the, my friends that had to go on welfare said that she, <laughs> here's what happened. She got a little bit of money from it, but they required that you go attend a class. And in this class, they trained you how to dress for an interview, how to make a resume, 
and gave you a list of jobs to go and apply for. And you, it is just like workers' compensation. You had to apply for a certain amount of jobs uh, and show that you had been there. And I thought that was interesting. Um, she ended up not being on it very long. The uh, Her husband got a job and she became a homemaker. And uh, it was so much trouble to apply. The application was so hard and also to have to go for all those interviews was quite a few interviews. And she couldn't spare the time for it because she basically was a homemaker. And so that that have, has in uh, has changed here. The other thing that has changed is that the, some of the Planned Parenthood clinics in my area are closed. I don't know uh, much about what that is, but they are not there. There's no interest. They didn't have enough customers apparently, so that was nice. There are other things that have changed too, and that is things are cleaner. I have noticed. Uh, now we have a law in the in this state, especially you cannot throw any trash on the road or in front of a business or anything. You can't do anything to hinder anybody's business and uh, it's it's a lot cleaner. There are other things that have changed, but, but particularly what I like, I think, is the, the optimism and the happiness. And so I wanted to go into that because I talked about that yesterday when you have your sourpuss friend that you go see and um, she disses everything that you say. So I wanted to talk about you because what happens with when these people are around they often poison you they put that little poison in you and you come home and you're snappy with everybody and you're unhappy and I remember when I was really really young I went to see uh, someone who invited me over I had a little child and um, the way she was getting her child to do what she said was she was yelling very loud at him and uh, I never had to do that I never saw that to be necessary, but after being with her all afternoon, I came home and my voice was raised, started to raise my voice more. Uh, so you have to be careful that their gloom does not rub off on you. And so to, to just analyze this a bit, if you are, if you do if find yourself being very, very disgruntled, very unhappy, very sharp with everyone at home, and you need to look in a few, into a few things. Have you seen this friend? Has this friend been around you? Who have you talked to? Who has talked to you? Kind of go back and tra trace it. And the other thing is, have you lost sleep lately? Are you tired? Are you just now getting sick? Maybe you're coming down with something. This will be a difference. Uh, how, are, how is your uh, digestion and elimination? This will have a difference on you, on your mood. So look, look to those things. Are you healthy? How much water have you been drinking? And one thing that has changed for me is that I, I know a lot of people told me don't drink distilled water because it doesn't have all the minerals in it. But if you take uh, vitamins and minerals, you don't have to worry about that. But I began drinking distilled water and it's, it has a, it's easier to, for me to swallow. It has kind of a sweet taste and it also, um, has eliminated some of the sinusitis that I used to get and uh, I feel so much better within just a few days I could feel the difference uh, I don't know uh, if that's scientific or not but it works for me so um, so now I want to also talk about uh, clothing again and the inability to get in, get modest clothing you know, there is a scripture that says that uh, whatever the temptation is, God will provide an escape. And I remembered this from the 1960s because fashion and clothing industry was undermined by uh, people who were making clothing into a statement and a, I don't know, something, something different about a rebellion. They were using clothing as a cultural rebellion. And so... Uh, I believe it was a designer called Mary McFadden that created the miniskirt, and there might have been others beside her, but her loyalties were not to uh, make people have more dignity, but uh, the, uh, the whole thing was so difficult that in the 60s, if you didn't sew, and even then, if you did sew, it was hard to find patterns that were longer, so it was so difficult, but then I noticed 
that some designer, uh, and I lived in Australia at the time when I was 16, and and uh, my family had immigrated there as a family of nine, and we had immigrated there on a special program in the 1960s, and the miniskirt was just running rampant in the 60s. You couldn't find anything in the stores, and at the time I did not have a sewing machine, and it was very, very uh, discouraging. But I did notice there was one designer that was coming out with something called the, the maxi skirt or the midi skirt, something like that. And that some of the women had found these skirts and were wearing them. They were difficult to find and they were higher priced, but they were there. So that just goes to show that whenever there is something there that you think you can't avoid, God provides um, a way of escape. So if you're not happy with the wedding clothes that are available or anything, there are alternatives. And you just have to look harder for them. It's just not easy. You know, the way is broad when, you, when you're when you not looking. The way is broad for all these other things, for all the immodest clothing. But the way is narrow where if you're looking for something nice, they're just harder to find because they're more valuable, I guess. They're more exclusive. Uh, they're not as popular and they're of better quality you'll always have to go, it's like the woman in Proverbs that goes afar to find her food because it's better. So you're just going to have to look a little harder. It is there. It's just, uh, you know that it's there. And I, I just told you from the 1960s how I discovered that there was, there was the other designers. They just were, uh, you know, there's a whole history behind this. There was an effort by the clothing um, industry it was infiltrated by these designers that undermined uh, the way people were dressing, particularly women. And they undermined particularly the Laura Ashley company that had hundreds of stores all around the world and people loved her designs. She said in a video that you can still get, I believe, on uh, YouTube, that they weren't really designed for posh clothing or for wearing out or for posh wear. They were for the home. But they were so quality and so loved that women were wearing them, women who worked were wearing them to work and they were wearing them to fancy dinners and fancy dress things and were, she also had wedding clothes and some people were uh, buying the non-wedding clothes that were so pretty and wearing them as their wedding dress. They were that nice and they were of natural fibers. Well this was undermined, I believe began to be undermined in the 1980s and a lot of those uh, as, as these designers pushed these synthetic, non-woven, non-natural materials and the clingy clothing that was supposed to be more alluring. Uh, but it wasn't very nice because Laura Ashley's clothing was of such high quality cotton that it uh, flowed over the body in such a way as to hide all the, all the unwanted pounds and even the the thinner people liked it, liked it better. They didn't cling and uh, the cotton was comfortable, cool in the heat and warm in the warm when it was cold and there is a history behind it. You can look it up uh, how the Laura Ashley company was undermined and they began to close down a lot of those stores and a lot of the uh, clothing here in the US that was made that was of the cottons was replaced by clothing made in other countries not of natural fibers but I just want to give you that little bit of history but we do have the patterns and we can go get those so see there's a way of escape and sometimes you can get someone to sew for you and there are there's also I, I mentioned uh, a few a few posts back a list and some links of some catalog companies where you can go and order things. And the closest to Laura Ashley that I could find was April Cornell. A lot of hers are 100% cotton. She uh, does have some longer, longer things. So if you want to go and look at that, they are quite expensive. But like I said, there is a way of escape from the modern immodest clothing, especially for the home. And so um, I want to go on to a few other things here. Um, you know, we talked about, uh, I talked about before, it, the 
idea that that uh, you can use a, a vitamin E capsule, which vitamin E is very sticky, so you can't put it on your skin directly, but you can mix it with another kind of uh, oil and put it on your skin. Uh, and I realize a lot of people are very self-conscious about their wrinkles or about their their face not looking soft and that sort of thing. And I will say this, that I know a lot of you uh, who are older have earned their wrinkles and I would say one thing about this, and that is let the wrinkles be happy ones and um, not wrinkles that are from constant gloominess. Gloominess and pessimism will give your face a totally different look. Now for an example, those of you who like the old Jane Austen movies that were done in the 1990s might remember the one with Captain... Wentworth, and I'm trying to think what that is. Goodness sakes, I can't remember the name of it. But uh, he had a, I believe he had a brother that was on a ship, and his wife went with him. And uh, I always liked her face. It's a bit wrinkled, but she she was happy. Uh, goodness sakes, I can't can't think of what the name of it was. It was the one about the woman who um, had the gloomy sister. You know, she would go see her sister, and her sister. Uh, was unhappy and always sick and and uh, so she would try to cheer her up but she just had this attitude you know and uh, so I just want to say if you do if you are getting older and you do get wrinkles make them happy happy ones because you'll look different if you're a sourpuss it makes wrinkles in different places so um, now I don't know what else uh, I could I could talk about but I I wanted to tell you that I uh, have been getting this magazine, and it probably show backwards on my computer from the olden days. Um, it's called the Cooks Illustrated, and I like it because they'll show uh, a step-by-step -step way of making something. And you know, sometimes if you've cooked a while, you just need a change. And I like the chatty way that they write about this whatever they're making. Uh, they'll say something. You know, I, I like scones, and there was one place at this restaurant where they had the, the most marvelous scones. They weren't too dry, and they were soft like a like a yeast biscuit. Uh, but I and I wanted to find out the secret to these scones, and I tried this, and it didn't work, and this, and it didn't. It's like the way that some of these sewers, the sewists, the uh, stitchers, will have a site, and they will show some a pattern they had, and they'll show up the fabric they use, and they'll say, I like this fabric, except that it it shredded or it did this and I wanted to fix that and so I did this and this and it's a, a narrative and it's a story and it's so much it's so interesting to follow so I wanted to tell you about this Cook's Illustrated. I also believe they're they're related to um, a television program that you can get on YouTube and goodness sakes I can't even remember what that was called I have so much on my mind but uh, they're the ones that showed that you know you would think everybody knows how to boil an egg and it's been shown several times but this uh, it was Cook, Cook's Country I think it was called and it was a television show in the olden days and um, they showed how to boil an egg in, in such a different way and I tried it and it worked and it was to prevent it from turning green and they said uh, you first put it in cold water this is how they did there's different techniques put, put it in cold water bring it to a boil, boil it for a minute, turn off the heat, and put a lid on it. Let it set five minutes. You'll get a hard-boiled egg with no green around it, and then you put it under cold water, and the shell will come off easily. So it was interesting to watch that, but I believe that this magazine is related to the Cook's Country. So this is called a better French omelet, and I really enjoyed laying down, putting on some soft music, laying down on my couch, and reading this article. So I'm going to read a little bit to you and I'm not sure uh, how long this video is going to go but I'm hoping you are going to get busy and get something done and not sit here and watch me and uh, the, the Cook's Country, Ill Cook's Illustrated is available at your Safeway store and your Walmart and I mean probably your your newsstands and your bookstores too, but those are the only. And I live out in the country, and those are the two stores that are available to me. I've been criticized because I use those two stores, but I don't have anywhere else to go, and I need to get home and not be running 
you know, play across the straight state for some politically correct um, store. So <coughs> here's um, here's what he says here. Uh, his name is Charles Kelsey, and here's what he said. And I like the way that he writes because. Uh, of the, how he expresses his frustration of trying to get these omelets just right and how they were so, it's so elusive. And also I read an article about scones in one of these, or scones, in one of these Cook's Illustrated that was so good and it talked about what a difference it made when they heated the cream to uh, blend in with the flour. They heated it first. And uh, it, it was so scientific. It was talking about these molecules and how it made it such a difference in the uh, softness or the density of this scone, and you can get that online somewhere. Um, Cook's Illustrated or Cook's Country, how to make a scone, and they will explain that. Uh, you can also get a, you can also sign up for their newsletter that will come into your email, and that particular article is on there. But I just when they, when you get the emails, they're interesting too because they will say things like. Uh, the reason we do this is because it makes this softer. And the reason we put this in at this time is because it prevents it from uh, coagulating and doing this and that. And they'll give you a reason for every ingredient. And they'll tell you what the ingredients do. They will tell you what baking soda and baking powder do. They will tell you the baking soda turns it brown and the baking powder does uh, lifts it. And they will tell you how to make homemade baking powder so you don't have to have the, uh, the caustic ingredients in it. And they will tell you how... Uh, Sometimes they will tell you how people used to raise their products without baking powder. And it's it makes it a little more interesting, especially if you're like me and you've been cooking for, you know, like since you were eight years old <laughs> and, and you're pushing 70. Uh, it's, it's always nice to have something that's a little uh, stimulating and bright. And that's one of the reasons I like homeschooling is that you get your children around you and as they become adults, you start uh, bouncing ideas off of each other and exchanging things. And it's so much fun to get a, an email from one of them saying, I just discovered this uh, link. Go here and look at this. And, and we, uh, we grew up sharing life. I mean, I grew up with them because I learned along with them and we grew up sharing life. So there's, there's no such thing as a generation gap when you've homeschooled your kids. Now, I know a lot of you didn't. And what I always say uh, is you just work with what you can and you go with how you can go and don't worry about it. Don't have too many regrets. Just encourage the next generation. So I'm going to read some of this. He says, um, success with omelets is maddeningly elusive. The temperature of the pan must be just right. The eggs beaten just so, and your hand movements as swift as your ability to gauge the exact second the omelet is done. With everything happening at lightning speed, even a few extra seconds of cooking can smell, spell disaster. In an attempt to unscramble things for chefs and home cooks alike, Julia Child devoted 11 pages to omelet making in Mastering the Art of French Cooking, concluding that success takes a lot of practice and no surprise, a lot of flubs. I'm all in favor of tradition when it works, but surely it was high time to figure out a different approach to making this creamy style omelet, one that even an inexperienced cook could get the right, could get right the first time around. Well, that's what we're looking for, isn't it? When you're first uh, starting out and you're cooking, and maybe you're a child, I can remember crying because something didn't turn out. It seems like you always cry when you're learning something new. You know, that's why these, uh, <laughs> that's why these people that are such downers in your life, the ones that, uh, I enjoy talking about it because I do get letters from people that have a friend that uh, they can't please because they're always contradicting them. That's why they cry when you tell them something good. That's why they pout because they're learning something. And it's hard. So... Uh, stirring conclusions. This is what he wrote. I began by examining the equipment. The classic method calls for an omelet pan <clears throat> made of high quality black carbon steel, <clears throat> preferably reserved exclusively for eggs and seasoned over a period of years. 
and a fork. Modern concessions allow for a non-stick skillet and heat-proof spatula. Certainly, an 8-inch non-stick pan seemed like a fine idea. I wasn't so sure about a bulky spatula. In the kitchen, I first tested two omelets side by side, one using a spatula, the other using a fork. Forks usually scratch non-stick pans, but I figured I could sacrifice one pan for testing. I don't use those pans, those non-stick pans. They've got stuff on them that eventually as they get older, that stuff will get on your food. I, I just decided not to use them anymore. We used three eggs per omelet, along with salt, pepper, and butter as, as the cooking fat. I started as instructed by many classic tomes. I preheated the pan for several minutes over high heat to get it good and hot, added the butter and waited for it to melt, and then poured the seasoned egg mixture and got busy stirring. The difference was clear. The fork did a better job than the spatula, scrambling the eggs into smaller curds and silkier texture. I even achieved the same results using bamboo skewers and wooden chopsticks without scraping my pan. But there was a problem. The omelets were turning out brown and splotchy instead of evenly golden. Thankfully, there was an easy fix. The browning was due to hot spots over the pan's bottom, which I was able to eliminate when I preheated the pan for a full 10 minutes over low heat. Next up, creamy texture. Typically, to achieve a creamy omelet, you pull the eggs off the heat at just the right moment, but it's nearly impossible to know when that occurs. What if I cheated and used creamy ingredients instead? So in my next test, I made omelets with heavy cream half and half. The results were richer but tougher. I recalled an intriguing recipe I'd found in my research. It called for adding diced butter, about a tablespoon, to the beaten eggs right before cooking. I heated up a pan and, it went, and in went the butter uh, studded egg mixture. As I stirred the eggs, I observed the butter melting. At first I thought the excess butter was going to yield a greasy, overly rich omelet. But then I noticed the creamy fat fusing in with the eggs. Sure enough, the butter made the omelet richer and creamier. I couldn't believe it, so I made another dozen omelets using the same technique, and those were creamy too. As it turned out, very cold butter. I popped it into the freezer for a few minutes before cooking. I remember it was diced. Melted less quickly than merely chilled butter, allowing it to dispense more thoroughly throughout the eggs, producing the creamiest results. Melted butter, on the other hand, clumped in one area. There was one hitch. Some tasters thought the butter made the omelet a little too rich. I removed some protein, one egg white, and cut the butter in just half a tablespoon, which satisfied everyone. But what he did was he took the three eggs and he, with one of them, he uh, separated it and put just the yolk in with the mixture and kept the white for something else so that it wouldn't be so, so much protein in it. And in this whole article they explain how protein uh, properties are changed through heat, through what you mix with it and everything. and um, even uh, the taste, and it's, it's just, it just might not be fascinating to you, but you that's another thing you can do is you can go to Cook's, Cook's Illustrated or Cook's Country on YouTube and you can listen to. Now, one thing is, I don't like videos. If I'm doing housework, I don't like videos I have to stop and pay attention to, but you might like that. You might like to just listen to it. So today, I'm trying to uh, make this a little longer. I see I've only gone about 35 minutes. Yesterday I went about 40 minutes. And so today I am thinking that maybe I might be brave and in the future have one of those um, online uh, question and answer things or just interactive, uh, an interactive video. For goodness sakes, I can't even think of what it's called. Need that eight year old here, don't I? Tell me <laughs> about all this technology. So I hope that you can get something done while you watch this. Remember to start with your uh, attitude and your appearance. And when I mention prayer, I am talking about, you know, not some kind of fly-by prayer, oh Lord help me, when you're in trouble, but have some meaningful prayer and some meaningful, that's how you communicate with God. Have some meaningful prayer. You're going to find a difference in your stress level. Now, as I mentioned before, 
stress is normal. We're not supposed to eliminate it, but it's how you handle it. And you will find that life will have its ups and downs. This is what a lot of people have to learn. And I've heard women say, well, what did I do wrong? I, uh, I'm a good housekeeper and I tried to follow the Titus 2 rule. That does not mean everything's going to go uh, perfectly with you. You have to learn to, uh, you know, they used to say roll with the punches. And if you've ever watched, if, <laughs> I hope not, but if you've ever seen boxing, uh, they have a technique of when someone hits you, you roll with the punch because you don't just accept it hard on because it could damage you. So if you want to study uh, boxing, you can go study boxing and see what that roll with the punch is. And that's another figure of speech. I know there have been a couple of object objections to me using these figures of speech because we've got this uh, reality stuff going on where people think that you're not telling the truth if you use a figure of speech because that's not really uh, that's not really quote the truth but figures of speech have been used from the beginning of time and that's why I use the, the a lot of the Bible references to figures of speech and you can't hardly start reading the Bible without coming across one for instance here's something that uh, is quite amazing is these people that uh, are on the the news, you know, the newscasters from the big companies, and they'll do, they'll make some kind of a personal narrative, and they'll mention that so and so just thinks they're holier than thou. Well, that comes from the Bible, and a lot of these people are atheists; they don't even believe the Bible, but they'll use biblical phrases. And while I'm talking about that, now I don't have television, but I do have computer, so sometimes I do see some of the conservative news sites and what's most disturbing about them is that although they claim to be pro-family and pro-home and uh, you know in, in free enterprise and very solid um, uh, finances and things like that and just all the things that we believe in and things that I teach on this blog uh, you will notice there's a man on one side and a man on the other side, and there's a woman in the middle. She's always young and very pretty, and the men are these newscasters. They're reading the news, and they're reading them on camera. The men are covered from their neck to their toes. Their wrists are covered. They have a suit on. They're covered, totally covered. The woman that sits in between, now this is supposed to be conservative news. Tell me why these women cannot find uh, sleeves or uh, dresses long enough to cover their legs and their, bare, their bareness, there's more bareness on them, they have low cut everything, or they'll have a clothing that has cut outs, cut outs all over, all over them. And you tell me why these men are covered from, covered completely, their bodies are completely covered and the women are so immodest and they're supposed to be um, pronouncing conservative values. I don't understand that. Would somebody please design them some clothes? You know even the uh, royalty. Now I do not always study English. I'm not talking about English royalty. But uh, a lot of European, uh, Sub-Saharan, African, Asian royalty. The women are, the women cover themselves and they go out in public and they shake hands and they um, they go to visit their uh, the places that they support uh, their hospitals and their retirement centers and, and other places that help people and they are dressed uh, they are dressed they are covered their arms are covered their their neck is usually covered they don't they save the uh, the bare clothing for their evening um, fancy evening things you know and so tell me uh, could some of you please design some clothing for these um, for these women, these women, female, young female newscasters, that I believe that uh, some of the older women started that trend many years ago. But I can't understand why the men are covered and the women are not. Uh, and it's supposed to. I suppose they're trying to be more feminine. But you know, another thing you'll notice in our Congress of the United States and in our Congress, uh, our state congresses. You know, we have our House of Representatives in the state. Each state has one too. Uh, that the that the more liberal women who promote things that uh, we can't that we can't agree with <laughs> are dressed well. 
they do cover themselves. They cover their arms. They cover their uh, their their chest area, their neck. They wear longer skirts. I just can't make sense of this at all. So if you can make sense of it, please write to me. Leave me a comment. And uh, also anything else you want to discuss. There was a suggestion that I make a speech about how not to be lazy. I honestly don't feel qualified to do that. One of the problems with laziness is it starts when you walk past, the first time you walk past something that needs to be put away, something that needs to be washed, something that needs to be repaired. You, you walk past it, you put it aside. And uh, that's what I do, and I haven't been able to overcome it in all these years, and I have, you know, it just starts to add up. But one of the things that I learned about the mail was in the days when we had, in the olden days, when we had mail in the mailbox, and there were a lot of, there's a lot of it. The rule that we learned was you bring it in the house, and right away, you put it where it's supposed to go. You don't take it, put it in a pile on the end of your cabinet in the kitchen, and say you're going to get to it later. You distribute it first thing, and that is what we should be doing that will help our laziness also your mental attitude helps your laziness if you get up in the morning and you feel like life sucks and life is sour and all this you know it used to be the elderly people that were like that they were always trying to hold you back and and they were depressed and they had they were uh, gloomy but now it's so shocking that it's the younger people it's of course everybody's younger than me but i'm talking about the teenagers they're not happy and they don't look at life as they haven't been taught to look at life as something that they look forward to every day when many of them have a whole life in front of them more years in front of them than in behind them I have less years in front of me than behind me and I'm happy so I want uh, to I want to spread that I want to spread happiness and I uh, want to do more on that I will try to do a video and a talk on how to overcome laziness as soon as I overcome it. So until then, God bless you. Don't forget to pray and please leave a comment. Thank you and goodbye.